How would you find satisfaction in a nuclear holocaust? Welcome, my mere mortal lads, to another round of the Mere Mortals book reviews. My name is Kyron, host of the Mere Mortals podcast, but I also do this one where we dive deeper into the books that we're reading to get out the juicy information to give a summary, some reviews, some takeaways, some things to ponder upon. And indeed, we do have a lot to ponder upon today because we are reading On the Beach by Neville Shute. So this book was originally published in 1957 and it's about 300 pages in length. So it'll take you a good five to six hours roughly to, to get through. And basically we start with a fight, a nuclear fight in the Northern Hemisphere. So the story is set in Melbourne, Australia, and we follow two naval officers and their friends and family as they begin to see the ramifications of all of this thing that's been happening. So it's been firmly established. There's a, a the Northern Hemisphere has basically blown itself to pieces. Everyone has died there seemingly because of the radiation and we're gradually seeing that this radiation is approaching further and further south because they're communicating with other people via radio and we can see, oh, you know, Brisbane's starting to develop some signs of this sickness, this radiation. And then two weeks later, basically everyone in Brisbane has died and it's gradually moving its way down over the period of months. So because this takes quite a while the plot is really driven by this mysterious signal that's coming from seattle in uh, north america and there's some hope that oh maybe there's some survivors there and these two naval officers take the one remaining submarine one remaining vehicle of any sort really that that is able to to be moved around due to lack of oil and things like this and they go on this quest with other people, obviously manning the submarine to go and check out what's happening there. Now, I won't particularly spoil what they find. So I'll just tell you that the book really examines people's reactions to this seemingly inevitable death that's coming to their duty to a, a country that perhaps no longer exists and also homesickness and what you would do in your final days on earth. Now, I'll touch upon the author and the book. The, it's, he's not particularly known for his apocalyptic work, Neville Shute, it, although this is his most famous book by far. Uh, and I have previously covered one before uh, called Ruined City, which was more about social structure and things like this. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing because he's just not particularly known for this style of writing. And he was an Englishman who moved to Australia in the later part of his life. So I'm going to count this as a win for the Aussies. <laughs> and uh, that will actually play a little bit of a part in some of my observations that are coming up. But first, we'll go into the themes. And the first one is nuclear holocaust. How would humanity actually behave? So I am going to give some spoilers here because it is important to, to know what actually happens in the book. And we kind of see that, first of all, there's this acclimatizing to scarcity. Once the, the bomb has already been set off and we kind of begin the, the book quite sharply, really, there's all this kind of implicit uh, information that's already known by all the characters. There's, they already know that there's been bombs going off. They already know that basically everyone in the Northern Hemisphere has died. They already know that this sickness and this radiation is coming to get them. So uh, they're very acclimatized to scarcity already they're hoarding their oil and their petrol for their cars there's a lot less um, proliferation of just random goods and things like that there's, there's kind of a little bit of bare bones living there's still a slight hope and business continues as normal people are still um, doing busybody things there's still structure in the navy for example there's still a hierarchical demand uh, command there's still um, you know, barter and trade and things like this. Uh, but then we also start to see as it gets worse and worse that there's some other aspects which you perhaps might, might not expect. For example, there's no lack of migration. Uh, there, there's a lack of migration. People aren't trying to escape it. They roughly stay in the city that they're in and, and just die there. Uh, towards their final end when they really know what's happening and what's gonna like it seems really inevitable that they're going to die um, that's when they start to splurge a little bit and they start to do all of these things that perhaps they wouldn't have done previously and then finally most of the characters end up committing suicide rather than succumb to the actual awful 
um, way to go, which is kind of like cholera. So you you, you vomit, you, you you shit, you just lose all your water, you become incredi- incredibly weak and then you die. So there's, I suppose, a couple of things I want to examine here. The first being sanity maintenance, which is how 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 do you stay sane in this sort of situation where your death is almost guaranteed and you know it's going to come in six months time give or take a few weeks how do you maintain your sanity in this condition a lot of the characters in the book seem to do this by planning for a future that wouldn't come so so many examples of people who would just go oh yeah we're going to plant this tree in the garden uh where you know it'd be really nice to get married someday oh man you know i still want to have some kids you know they're still giving birth and things like that and it really is interesting to see okay that to maintain their sanity they really need to to have a fixed goal beyond what they know is is really possible in a way so I guess, can you psychologically go on when you know that your end is coming up and it's going to come very soon? And does this delusion help of having this, uh, you know, it's not, it's, it's almost like willful ignorance in a way. So it kind of makes sense in a way. And, and if you're looking at it in terms of time preference, so you still need to delay gratification at, at some point. And so this does require being able to think longer in the future. And in particular, in it's, you know, I can't really tell the difference between one year out and two year out, for example. That, that's kind of hard to plan for because it's just so long away that it, it becomes ha- hazy and fuzzy. And so I think it is kind of rational in many ways for characters to think, you know, that it's coming, this death is coming in maybe a year's time. Um, you know, there's not that much difference between one year's time and 10 years time when you're looking that far out. So yeah, you know what? I'm just going to pretend that I'll plant this tree and I'll be able to watch this sunset with the shade of this tree in 10 years time. I think that makes sense in a way. And, but when it gets closer and closer, we start to see the characters, the, the delaying of gratification, that time preference gets um, a lot more higher, I believe is the way that you say it. So their their preference for the time that is coming up, they, they know, oh, okay, um, I do actually value what's going to happen in the next month a lot more because I can kind of predict it a, a lot more. And this is where we start to see them splurging and, and doing things that they wouldn't normally do. Now, this is all well and good for a book, but other historical examples of this or in other areas of literature how, how do people approach this and this is where i kind of come away going ah, i'm not too sure so we have some historical examples like you could say that the bombing of hiroshima by john hersey which I, i've covered on this channel before you know the the people in there even though they had this completely radical death scenario you know their whole life got turned upside down in an instance there was still you know, it's kind of different because there was no certainty that there would be, you know, rate dying of radiation in the next week or in the next month or in the next year, like like happened to many of them. But there was no chaos. There was no anarchy. People immediately after after getting like the bare essentials in place, running water again, shelter and things like that. You know, they they tried to just go on their lives with their lives and live a normal life again. How about in Man's Search for Meaning? That seemed like a relatively bleak scenario. So that was where Viktor Frankl was in the, um, he was in particular in Auschwitz. And, you know, in that situation, I would have said the certainty level of dying is pretty much as high as the characters in this book would have. And yet characters, people, not characters, actual people would still continue to live on and they would do it by creating an arbitrary reason. So for Viktor Frankl, it was his manuscript. He needed to complete this manuscript. You know, his whole family, his, his, his wife and children and things like that, he, they'd all pretty much been taken away and, you know, you have to assume the worst that they've died and they did in fact die and yet he still found the faith to go on by creating a book. Like what? That that doesn't particularly make sense and yet the the focus, the the grabbing onto something and just using that 
as a as a thing to pull you through i think that does kind of make sense in a way even though it doesn't make sense but it makes sense you know uh in lord of the flies for example all of the kids there they basically go crazy they the the social structure breaks down they and i'm kind of just trying to pick out these situations where it seems like there's no hope in a way and in that case they're children and they basically revert to this animalistic nature uh, b- brutality, um, and that there is no kind of hope for the future for them, and they everything becomes much, much worse. So, how would humanity behave in a nuclear holocaust? The original question. It, it's it's so hard to tell. I do think that there would be this tendency to gr- latch onto some sort of hope, even if it is rationally makes no sense and yet delude yourself into thinking that and then use that as a meaning to continue living on right up until basically the very bitter end. I, I, I think that kind of makes sense to me and that perhaps what we would happen. But there is no one answer to this as well. And I, I think other books that explore this would perhaps come up with uh, different answers. But this does lead us on to the second theme that I really pulled out of this, which is satisfaction. What brings an individual pleasure? So right up in that end point when they started to splurge what what was it that really brought these characters the greatest meaning from their life and i think this is kind of a unique angle that was presented in this book because i wouldn't say it's contentment so contentment kind of for me implies over a long time period a long scale you can it's it's kind of a a mid-level good feeling if you have to put it that way joy seems a bit too extreme joy is a very spontaneous more like an emotion happiness for me implies uh, once again a very short time preference you know i'm happy today but will i be happy you know tomorrow it depends my mood could change uh, i could get rear-ended or something like that and so i think in this the unique angle is that we see that all of these characters are, uh, have a small bounded time and it's shared by all of them, uh, which is very different to someone going through cancer, for example, like you could see in Mortality by Christopher Hitchin, that, that book. That is a very individual process and it's, it's so bizarre because you're having your whole world rocked and shortened, yet the world goes on as normal for everyone else. So this is I like what I liked about this book was that it it really did create this scenario where everyone is going through the same thing. Once again, there's no particular answer. So from the actual book, we found that John, who was one of the naval officers, for him it was uh no, sorry, he he was one of the scientists on board the uh, the the vessel. For him, it was conquering a fear, and so this was where he had this dreaded fear of racing motorcycles and doing crazy adrenaline pumping things and he you know somehow bought a ferrari and then for him right at the end when he was splurging was when he'd saved up all this gasoline and was now racing other people in these incredibly dangerous races on these uh, on these tracks where all the cars basically were got flying off the track at you know 300 k's an hour and running into trees or flipping and dying and all of this mayhem, but for him, it was conquering this fear. For another character, Moira, so this was uh, the young lady who falls in love, somewhat falls in love with the American uh, naval officer. For her, it's it's creating a connection. It's, it's forming a bond with another human being. With Dwight, so this is the naval officer, for him, it's planning a reunion with his dead family and, and you know, creating an an expectation to meet them and staying true to his morals of being a, a officer of the US Army, which he ends up becoming the, I think it's like Supreme Admiral or something like that, because basically everyone else dies. And so the uh, command just gets put onto him, even though he's just the captain of a, uh, of a submarine. For Peter, it's his garden and Peter and his wife, it's uh, their garden, their kids. What what are they going to be like? We'll plan for this future. Uh, it's it's very interesting just seeing that people would create different things and 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 latch onto. Well, not latch onto, but that's that's how they derive their satisfaction right up into the end point. Now, this all gets, I guess, into the question: Is 
did they need this event to be able to to live life the way that they really wanted to is this really the life way they wanted to, to live life and th- there's a hard one i guess because when you're going through cancer for example and you perhaps decide oh i want to live life the way i've always wanted to live life and not be afraid of this thing i want to pick up this hobby which perhaps is society is is not approving of for a a person like me or something like this or tell that person that that girl I've always had a crush on that I I love her or or you know whatever it may be it's so hard because the in this scenario everyone shares this thing so everyone realizes oh okay this this connection this um it it makes sense this um this incoming death it really puts a focus on you've got a couple of months to live. How do you want to live that? And what will give you the most satisfaction from that? Um, I think this is doable in every day, day life for all of us, but you do have to kind of put in the work of contemplating death, which is really not fun. <laughs> it is a bit, it is quite morbid because it, it does really put into focus. You know what, Kyron, you've only got what max another 70 years to live maybe if I get to 100 you know that's that's kind of the age my my grandparents got to or one of my grandparents got to that that requires effort and time and and I think you can get the the satisfaction without the actual real impending death I I think I, I I think I'm trying to live the way life I would live my life if I had only two months left to live right now as I would with you know, if I've got 70 years left to live. So I think it is possible, but it does require work to do that. And if you're not putting in the work, then you can go through a whole life living a way that you, where you're not getting the satisfaction, not doing the things where on your deathbed, you look back and go, I, I regret not, you know, I regret too, working too much. I regret not telling people I love them enough all the kind of classic regrets that people have. I regret that I wouldn't let, I didn't let myself be happy. All those sorts of things, though, those, I, I would argue that those people in their deathbeds who have done that, it's because they haven't spent the time contemplating death in, in their life. So yeah, I think that's the, one of the things to take out from this book is that, yeah, you know what, if you're, you know, satisfaction, what brings individuals pleasure, you probably can only discover that if you're willing to put in the time of thinking about your own mortality and your own death. And in that case, you know, trying to really use your imagination to find out, okay, if I only had X amount of time left, what would I actually want to be doing with my time? What would bring me the greatest satisfaction? So uh, I think that's actually something that we can all take away from, from this book and something that would be quite useful. Let's get on to my own personal observations and takes takeaways. There's a vacillation for me with this, which is I feel, would I do this in this scenario? Is this how I would behave? And for sometimes I would say, yes, the characters in the book, that's exactly how I'd behave. And then in others I go, that just does not seem right. And in particular, it would be, uh, you know, continuing to live on and doing a job, uh, per se, I would, I think that would just make no rational sense to me. I, I, I would, I would still have civility toward other human beings, but would I be willing to, to continue working in a store, for example? I'm, I'm not sure. There seems to be, would, would there still be a functioning economy that happens in this book? You know, the, one of the things that I got from this was wow, there, there's a real, everything's working kind of normal, you know. They can't use cars, for example, but the the police still function. There's still, in general, there's no rioting, for example, in the book. There's no rampant murders, nor looting, nor, you know, the general just mayhem that I think you would expect from this scenario, um, which I feel is somewhat lacking in the book. I, I, that's one of the ones where I went, man, it, it just does, it seems too orderly. It seems that he hasn't captured the the mayhem that would go on, the the chaos that would perhaps ensue. But then again, that if if it's been kind of six months time, you would think that, or or a year or two since the initial nuclear blasts, 
maybe this is how people would kind of default to a, a, a functioning society of some sort. I don't know. The unraveling of society, I think it, 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 I think something was lost there. And this could also come into the fact that he was an Englishman. So when he came to Australia, he's, he's all of the characters of bar one are Australian. And in this case, I feel, yeah, maybe he's just lacking a bit of what the Australian characters would, that uh, how I see Australians would behave. Maybe it's because this is from the 1950s. So, you know, that's people from 70 years ago. That's, yeah, I, I suppose that's the um, that that could be a, a, a determining factor that people people definitely change their their mode of speaking and how they behave. And seventy years is a pretty decent time gap. So yeah, that that could be a couple explanations. And um, I'd be intrigued to know if you found the the same thing from your reading of the book. Was is this how you think characters would actually behave? There was also some other elements of just absurdity that came in, which were lightning but also yeah once again it's like ah is this is this actually what would happen so the on on one of the right towards the end one of the kind of uncles of the guy who is doing all the all the race car driving and whatnot uh he's in this uh it's called the pastoral club and they're basically just he sets a goal for himself to drink all of the wine in the cellars because, you know, why the hell not? And he's basically getting sloshed every day, drunk out of his mind. And when he's being told how, you know, what's going to happen after we're dead, you know, it'll come. Some animals will survive longer than others. And in particular, rabbits, because rabbits seem to have an immunity against this, uh, the radiation for an extra year or so. And, and he's, he's like outraged. He's going like, the rabbits? Like we've been fighting so long against these blo bloody damn rabbits here in Australia and they're going to outlive us. And he's, and he's like gets into a rage about this, which is quite funny. Uh, the absurdity as well of people dying on these, on these kind of Grand Prix that they're organizing with these, you know, Ferraris and Maseratis and Formula One cars and things like that. The there's there's just this absurdity of people dying when they're going to die anyway uh yeah i don't know i i i, I kind of liked it um and that added a, a flavor a tinge to the book but it also it also felt a little bit strange as well so in total in summary uh i had to set aside some time after reading this in fact to to really do some pondering because i think it's a great book for um, showing mortality in a way which I hadn't thought of before, which is a, a kind of shared experience. You know, what would happen to society if everyone knew that they were going to die in six months' time in this manner and it was in a stage sort of thing? Uh, I think it's plus that he didn't overcomplicate matters. So there's no explanation of really why it happened or the, it, it's kind of just like, here's the facts everyone's already acclimatized to it. You better, as the reader, acclimatize to it as well. I think that was a really nice way of setting up the book. And it really did feel like normal people for, I would say, the most part and would consider how you would respond as well. So I wouldn't say it's a fun read because it's kind of morbid. You're, you're just thinking about death and, and dying, um, but it is very solid as well. So I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10 for On the Beach by Neville Shute. Definitely a good book if you're contemplating mortality, if you want to examine more of your own thoughts on how to find satisfaction in life, what really matters to you. I think this book could uh, spark some some interesting thoughts. And that is it for today, my immortalized. Thank you for joining me to this part of the video. What are your thoughts on On the Beach by Neville Shute? Is this how the characters would behave in, in real life, do you think, in a similar situation? I would love to know all of these things. The best way to do that is one, via a comment here in the YouTube channel, but also going over and uh, checking out the the podcast via the audio form and in particular on one of the new podcast apps.com. And in those, you have the ability to send a message directly to me as the creator whilst listening. So if you want to check out all of this in the gloriousness of audio only with some pictures attached as well, uh, I'd suggest doing that. And that's uh, kind of my favorite way because those messages have a... Uh, monetary payment attached as well called a boostergram, which you will see in the book recaps where I read them out and explain what that whole process is. So 
I really do hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. And I hope you're not in the Northern Hemisphere because you got blown up, son. (laughs) And we will catch you for the next one. Ciao for now. Chiron out.